Um, so at, welcome. Uh, my name is Greg Dunkley. I'm from the University of Vermont, and I direct the Business of Craft Beer program at UVM. And a uh, special uh, welcome to Will Gilson, head brewer at Idle Time Brewery in Stowe, Vermont. So this is a very informal uh, event. We're really here to have a conversation with Will about his uh, brewery, the beer he makes, his background, any questions that you might have, and just use the chat area to insert your questions. And Nicole, my colleague, um, say hello, Nicole. She's uh, Hi. she's at a camp somewhere, I think, in uh, in in Vermont. This is my camper. <laughs> your camper. So uh, so she will be bringing in the questions uh, throughout the evening, and um, we'll uh, welcome and take it away. Oh, okay, thank you. I am Will Gilson. I'm the head brewer at Idle Time Brewing Company in Stowe, Vermont. Could you grab the, I'll have my lovely assistants pass out the beer. Um, we're going to be tasting the first uh, four beers that we started canning. So some of you may have some of these. Let's see. Uh, the first one we're going to try today is the, the Hellas Lager. And um, Gosh, I've been in Stowe. How long have we been in Stowe? Eight years in Stowe. Uh, moved over from New Hampshire and uh, been brewing since the 90s. And I know uh, we can get we can get into this more later, but um, you actually grew up in the North Shore. Yeah, that's where my family is from, um, from okay. the Linfield area and stuff like that. Um, right. So... All right, so here we are with the Hellas. Yeah, so um, I figure we can get right into that. Did you have any other background questions you wanted to ask? Uh, we'll talk throughout the evening, we'll ask you questions okay, about great. your background. Okay, well, um, when I have a choice, I like to drink out of a glass. So I have a Pilsner glass here. Let's see if I'm a little too close. Um, Many years ago, I met a Dutch gentleman and he coached me on pouring a beer. Because initially, I was pouring it like this. Maybe like a home brewer would decant a beer. Uh -huh. But he grabbed that Grohl spear and he poured it like this. And he said, right. let, the, let the beer breathe. This gets right to the camera. So. A beer with a nice head is really going to help you with um, enjoying the aromas, um, the delicate uh, flavors, especially in the lagers that we make. So, um, yeah, I you can drink it out of a pint glass, um, but I like this Pilsner style glass as well. So, cheers. So, um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your Hellas uh, and how how it uh, is is similar or different in any way to other Hellas's that uh, you've tasted? Um, well, the Hellas style is um, is the type of beer that they drink in Munich by the liter. Um, and I studied German in um, high school, in college, um, and spent a bunch of time over there. So um, I think probably the first thing I learned about brewing was um, um, my palate, my taste buds, um, tasting good beer. Um, I think when I was 15, I probably tried beer a little bit, but after being in Germany for a month, um, I really loved beer. So I kind of learned um, firsthand what the German beers taste like, and um, they're highly revered worldwide. Um, so our Hellas is, um, compared to our neighbors in Stowe, um, it's probably a little more, a little maltier, uh, a little softer, a little rounder um, than what they do up the hill. Up the hill, theirs tends to be a little bit drier um, and um, not quite so malty. Uh, maybe a little bit more bitter. Um, so. Well, we have a question hmm. here from from James S. He says that okay. beer has uh, that beer has good good head retention. Do you have any wheat in the grist? I don't know. Um, I don't have any wheat in it. I do use a little bit of carapils. Um, you know, a clean glass really goes a long way. Um, sometimes you're at a bar, we can't really do it these days with COVID. 
take a glass that was already had beer in it and fill it again. We'll clean the glass first. But when you have residual oils um, or soap or anything on the glass, it'll knock the head down. So sometimes you'll get a glass of beer, pour the beer in, and the head won't last. And then you put a second beer in it, and all of a sudden the same beer holds its head. Um, and that's just an issue of you know a little bit of oils um, in the glass. But it'll also be from greasy food or anything. That'll knock down a head pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so James also has another question. Um, are you doing a decoction mash or a single infusion? Um, it's a single infusion step mash. So we have a, a German brewery, and what that means um, uh, for me as a brewer and for um, James, I believe, who's asking the questions, um, we can take the German malts and we can target the enzymes that turn starch into sugar over a 30 degree range, we can um, start at a lower temperature, heat it up, and stir it um, to um, so we don't scald it and we can control the temperature. And what that means is um, when the beer ferments, it tastes different than if you simply took the grain and mixed it together um, at one temperature to turn starch into sugar. Um, the best, the most traditional beers that I've made have been using this German um, brewing system. Um, I definitely do decoction mashes. Um, um, I usually use them mostly on the Bach beers. Um, I did initially use them on the Mertzens um, and some of the other beers, um, but it's pretty time intensive. And I think the malts that are out there these days, I'm pretty happy with the way our Fest Mertzen tastes um, just by going through um, the normal process of, of a, a controlled step mash, starting about 122 degrees and then bringing it up from there. Thank you. Um, so oh, and he was, asking, he was asking about the malt. No, we were using traditional Weyermann Pilsner malt. Um, you know, the protein rest is, is, is fairly short. Um, he was asking about the modified malt. In other words, do you need to give it more time to turn starch into sugar? Um, but no, we just uh, kind of been following that uh, traditional um, mashing profile. And Al is asking, what are some good tips for home brewers just starting out? Um, That's a tough question. <laughs> I, no, not really. Um, it, it is and it isn't. Um, a good water. Um, you know, if you're brewing with water that has, uh, um, is municipal and it has chlorine in it, um, you can let it sit overnight or you can boil it the day before and, and start with that. Um, you know, the second thing is, is if you can, I kind of usually describe it this way. It's really easy to take a powdered malt extract or a syrup malt extract. Mm -hmm and um, boil it and make a beer. But the beer tends to be, um, in the mouthfeel, tends to be a little one-dimensional. And the way people ask this type of question, usually I explain it as the difference between fresh roasted coffee and instant coffee. Well, instant coffee is fast, tastes like coffee, um, but there's certain thinness in the mouthfeel. And compared to um, if you had fresh roasted coffee and ground it, the reason why it's so much more enjoyable is it, it has uh, more complexity to it. Um, so I would say um, like what you make um, in terms of uh, a home brewer. Don't don't change the. If you find a recipe you like, try to make that same recipe again. Try to repeat it um, and see how it lasts over time. Um, in terms of you know, does it stay good for a month or when does it start to change? Um, I did that a lot early in my um, home brewing uh, career. When I was in Utah, I kept making the same stout over and over again, um, and it really taught me, you know, how things change because I had a little bit of scientific control. When you um, were in Utah, did you have a sort of a community of home brewers that you connected with? And I was a ski bum, Greg. I was a ski bum. <laughs> So um, I was skiing during the day and making beer at night or playing music or, or doing fun things. And um, 
<laughs> at time is uh, Salt Lake is different. You know, a lot of people know that. Um, there's a really great counterculture. But when I first got there, um, it was illegal to homebrew. But you could go to a homebrew shop and buy ingredients one pound at a time. So I guess um, if there were homebrew groups, I didn't really know about them. Um, so mm -hmm. we were, my buddy and I, who I brewed with, we were already starting from scratch and taking grain and cracking it and, mm -hmm. and making that um, extract wort you know, sugar water from scratch. Yeah. Well, hopefully the statute of limits, limitations are well past now. So. <laughs> they, they've changed some things out there, I think. When the Olympics changed, <laughs> they changed a little bit more. Um, you know, they still have different rules. Um, the first brewery I worked at was in Salt Lake. And at the time, you could only make 3-2 beer, um, which uh -huh. is a little limiting in some ways, but it's also very honest in terms of um, alcohol ha helps mask um, off flavors. So the beer, we were known for having good clean beer and I learned in the first uh, year that I was uh, brewing professionally um, how to make a nice clean beer and, and um, you know, by making low alcohol beer. Let's see. So, so Chris is asking what kind of 3.2 point uh, beers did you brew and oh, where? Gosh. Um, the brewery was called Squatters. Um, they only had a brew pub at the time. Um, they were making everything across the board. They were making, um, I think, mostly ales. Um, the IPAs we were making then were, um, you know, not the same as they are today. Um, I don't remember. I remember, remember making pale ales, but uh, I don't remember making IPAs. Um, and this was about uh, 1995. So, was that your first uh, commercial brewing position? Yeah. Yep. And because I had um, some experience, but maybe not years and years of experience, um, I was able to get a job at an even better brewery in Wyoming. So. Um, I followed my skiing career and brewing career north to um, Jackson, Wyoming, and uh, helped them win a lot of medals for the almost seven years that I was there. Well, okay. Well, let's um, let's move to uh, without pushing too much beer, <laughs> too short a period of time. Um, drink up. Let's move on to your next one. Okay, great. So the next one we're going to taste is the, um, actually it's through the Zogs, is the Zogs. So um, I know not everybody who's chiming in may not have the beers. So if you have any questions about the style that it is and um, you don't have it in front of you, please let me know. Um, I'm gonna grab a um, different glass. I'll be right back. Uh, while Will is grabbing a glass, this is my go-to beer. I happen to reside about a <clears throat> mile or two away from Idle Time Brewery in Stowe, Vermont, and uh, this is a, a fine product that um, I drink a little bit of. Okay, so with the, um, with the pale ales and the IPAs, um, we still want to um, pour it with a little vigor, but the amount of hops that are in it, we can't pour it as aggressively as um, as a lager and, and have it behave. So I'll pour it and then... Can you show the beer, the can again? Yeah. Here's the beer. So it's... Uh, uh, the music can. Yeah. So it's the Zog's Pale Ale. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I started putting this on the cans, kind of a, a personal note. Um, a little, some flavor descriptions here. I'm going to get it here. Yep. So what did I put on there? Uh, tropical Fruity. Crushable, fresh, and it's been interesting because I've seen other breweries follow suit and put um, uh, short flavor description words um, about their beer, which is pretty cool. Um, right, and that's yeah, the I best form, like of, to, best form like of flattery. Ride the beer. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is. Um, 
The Zox Pale Ale is a 5.6% uh, um, American Pale Ale. Um, some might call it a Vermont Pale Ale. Um, compared to the beers that we were making in the 90s um, and you know early 2000, um, it has quite a bit more hops in it. Um, and it has hop varieties um, that we didn't have back then. So some of the bittering hops that I use in it are classic, um, the style of hops that they use, um, you can say like maybe a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale or some of the other um, Pale Ales that have been around for a long time. Um, Chinook, Cascade, Centennial, um, some things like that. I'm using less Cascade these days. Um, but the dry hopping, um, which makes this beer um, really beautiful, I think, is the mosaic base. Um, so let's try the beer and see what we got going on. So in terms of aroma, I'm getting a little um, pininess, um, some, some fruitiness in the aroma. Um, in the mouthfeel, it's really round. Um, there's definitely um, uh, a lot of pale ales and a lot of IPAs out there that have gone drier and drier in terms of uh, their mouthfeel. This one's fairly round and uh, what we'd call juicy, I think, and I think it complements the hops really nicely. Um, James you know, is IBUs, how many IBUs. Yeah, yeah you know, um, off the top of my head, I, I don't really know what it is. It's um, I would say it's probably typical um, pale ale IBUs. It, it's not super high. Um, it's really just just enough IBUs that kind of balances the beer, maybe tasting too malty and sweet and still maybe too fruity. Um, when you look at the um, flavor wheel of um, the aromas that are typically come, that are typically with a, um, a hop, um, you have maybe floral and fruity and piney and different things. One of them is actually sugar-like. So even though your beer may be you know, fairly well attenuated and fairly dry, uh, a certain hops will actually add kind of like a, a, a sugar-like aroma, and that's, and that's the word that they use. James is also um, asking if you can describe the grist. Um, the grist is pretty straightforward. I've actually, um, you know, I, I use um, a good amount of uh, floor malt, um, faucet floor malt, and Canadian pale malt. Um, just a little bit of coloring malt. Um, I generally put a little carapils in, in most of the brews for a little head retention. Um, and, you know, I'm always tweaking things a little bit. Um, that's why I don't really um, print the IBUs and say this beer is exactly this because um, I like a guitar string. I like to try to tune it up and maybe make the beer a little bit better and, and, and change it a little bit. Um, nothing drastic, but just maybe make it a little bit more bitter. Um, and that definitely happens in the pale ale and um, in the IPAs, you know. Um, I think we make a good IPA. We've got the idle time and we've got also the double time. Um, but it's pretty interesting in a world where there's some really fantastic IPAs um, at your doorstep. So um, there's definitely some darling childs around. So, um, Sometimes bitterness can be metallic. Um, my wife describes it as maybe, um, when she tries a beer, um, she describes it as maybe uh, like chewing on a penny. Um, and it's kind of a metallicness um, that can come from some hops. Maybe, you know, Chinook and some of the different ones. Um, I kind of really try to ride that balance train of bitter enough um, and to let the hops come through and, and let them all come through as well. Steve R is asking, is your brew house gas fired or electric? Um, my brew house is propane, steam fired, high pressure, state of the art. It is quite sexy. It is the nicest brewery I've ever worked on. Um, and Sounds sexy. Yeah, many years ago when I moved over here and called my friend John Kimmick for a job. He offered me a job and I worked for him for a little bit. And uh, it was the brew house um, that pulled me away from him. I couldn't 
um, pass up this state-of-the-art brew house because it brought me back to really my home brewing roots when I would, you know, make double box at home when I was living in Utah or, you know, was up at the ski area. Um, I love to make all styles of beer, but I especially appreciate uh, a nice malty clean lager. Um, and we're definitely seeing lagers become more um, embraced by maybe people that have a little IPA fatigue. Tom. Um, James is James S is asking, are you mashing a little higher to keep some of that sweetness or just moving the hops later in the process? And he says whirlpool um, dry yeah, hops. hops go in the whole time. You know, the first hop that you add and you boil the whole time is the bittering hop. Um, that's the one I'm tweaking up. Um, to dry out the beer, um, there's definitely things you can do in terms of temperature to dry out the beer. Um, but the other thing is um, you know, some of the, the the floor malts tend to be more mouthfeel, I think a little rounder, um, and some of the less expensive um, um, pale malts, you know, still good quality, but they tend to ferment out um, drier. So it's one reason why some people actually add a good amount of wheat into a beer they're trying to maybe make a little spicy and also to dry out um, quite a few of our neighbors, that might be their secret ingredient. Um, that's my secret ingredient in my wheat beer. I put a lot of wheat malt in it. <laughs> so uh, Natty Dredd is saying, how has your brewing changed since Wyoming days? Well, has it changed? Um, hey, Natty Dredd. Um, <laughs> has it changed? Um, I guess I'm probably more mature. Um, I've, <laughs> the last... <laughs> The last two breweries I've been in, um, I've been the brewmaster where I was, um, you know, mentored by other brewmasters in the first two breweries. So um, say one year at the first brewery, seven at the next. So eight years. And now I've been, gosh, 20 years um, making the choices myself. So that's a big change. Um, you know, canning has been a big change as well. Um, we... Being in a brew pub, you have to juggle a lot in terms of you don't know how busy the restaurant's going to be. You don't know how much draft sales you're going to have. You don't know how cans are going to go um, until it actually happens. So there's a lot of juggling um, going on. So, um, you know, there's a lot that comes with wisdom um, and kind of, you know, knowing the right decisions to make. So, Will, let me jump in with a question. Um, do you have any uh, new... Uh, products that are in development or, or in your head that you're thinking about uh, making in the future? Well, we are lucky enough to anybody who's close by in Vermont, we are lucky enough to have a really large beer garden. And the state of Vermont let us open that back beer garden with all sorts of stipulations. But um, when it's pouring rain, because you can only come in to use the bathroom, we can't seat you inside. Um, but uh, you know, we can have about a quarter of our capacity outside. Um, so that's really nice. Um, Greg, could you repeat your question? Because I went off on a tangent. Uh, yeah, just about uh, new products, new things that you're in. Oh, new products, yeah. On so actually, about. I just canned yesterday. So I had a really long day because we canned uh, six different beers. Um, the four that we're tasting tonight, um, and we canned two new beers um, that are not new for us, but new in cans. And one was the Pilsner. Um, when the pandemic started, um, I had brewing space and we weren't selling any beers. And if you think of lagers as the marathon runner, they're going to taste good um, months from now, six months from now, right? And the IPAs and the pale ales that we put all the, the hops in, they're going to peak early and then drop off. Um, so you really want to enjoy those a lot sooner um, once they've been dry hopped, when we add that second batch of hops into the beer that's mostly fermented at this point is how we do it. Um, so those are new in cans. And then um, I'm a little slower, you know, I'm a little bit more of a traditionalist, I'm a little slower um, making new beers, but we um, have made like our third sour beer. Mm -hmm. So right now we've got a sour IPA that just got delivered to Beverage Warehouse. They got three cases. We'll see how long it lasts. Yay. Um, 
So it's uh, just under 6%. Um, it's a dry hopped um, IPA. So it's this big bouquet. And then when you taste it, it is um, pucker sour. People that sour say that's a nice sour. So that's always a nice compliment when you do something new and you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, and that's, you know, with some good tutelage and asking the right questions from other friends who've made a lot of sours. Um, the second sour um, that is also on tap is I took uh, my Bavarian wheat beer, which um, I should be proud of. Um, I'm pretty well known for that style. It's something I've been making year round for, gosh, probably 20 years now. Um, and um, we put some of that in cans as well. Basically, I need to move things along in the brewery um, and, and wanted to do some small scale um, market testing with those beers. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing we have going is we have an Imperial Stout um, and it's on some, um, um, some Smuggler's Notch uh, barrels. So we're excited to release that um, maybe come fall. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, guests uh, this evening who join us from uh, Virginia, North Carolina, perhaps other locations. But if you have thank a reason, you for coming from so far. Yeah, awesome. Beach. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't been to the the back uh, patio area of Idle Time in the summer, it's worth the trip up. It's a wonderful spot. Yeah. I was hoping to film from out there, but uh, I knew my Wi-Fi connection wasn't going to be good, and uh, this would have changed things, this thunderstorm we're having. Yeah, the, thunder, the thunderstorm's a little crazy. Um, Nat, Natty is asking, uh, what are your favorite artisanal hops? Ooh, well, um, there's a lot of new hops that are coming out there. Some of them are the old classics, and... Um, we like those, but there's a lot of new, um, what I call um, sexy hops out there. Um, everybody wants them, but they can, not everybody can get them. Um, and um, there's so, some hops that they haven't even proven themselves that uh, they don't even have a name yet. They only have a number. Um, many years ago, one of the hops I like to use um, that's in the, in the uh, Pink and Pale and in the Zogs, I think a little bit, is a hop called uh, Eucanaut, um, but the mm. hop started out as Equinox, and then the copyright guys came after him and said you couldn't call it Equinox, so they had to change it to Eucanaut, and it has a really interesting spelling, U, no, E-U-A-K-O-N-O-T, Eucanaut. Um, so that's a pretty interesting hop. Um, there's another, um, the other hop that I use is Mosaic. Um, before we had the really big boom of um, kind of at the beginning of the wave of, of all the breweries that were opening, uh, there were certain hops that were in, in low supply. So I had to kind of design the recipes with hops that I could get enough for the year. Otherwise I was making the Zogs and it wasn't gonna taste like Zogs in the future. So I kind of had to come up with a, a blend recipe. And with most of my hops, although Mosaic is the base hop and the dry hopping uh, it's only my guess is maybe in the 60 percent a little bit more than 60 percent range and it's a blend of other hops i think it's great to take hops whatever hop you like and do a one hop beer because then you can really taste what that hop does um but most of the time i find them a little wonder one dimensional um i guess i like food and my beer a little more um a little more different flavors, a little more nuanced, a little more tinged. Um, Steve R was asking if your if your sour was kettle soured. Yeah, very much so. Um, I've definitely done some experiments with Brettanomyces and some of the different things. Um, all the beers we've done have been kettle sours, um, and there's there's quite a uh, a learning curve with that because um, you know you kind of have to do things right. Um, we've had no problems with um, down the road with, of course, the lactobacillus that we use, the cultures. We've used Brevis. We used um, Clausus, I think, is another one. Um, basically, you're using an, an agent to change the pH of the wort. It doesn't really ferment the wort, um, but you have to really give it ideal conditions to grow. Um, it, 
unhopped wort. So we basically make a batch of beer. Um, we send it through the regular process of the day. We send it down to the basement and then we send it back up to the kettle. And there's been no hops in it at all. And that's where we add the culture of um, lactobacillus that's been growing on unhopped wort with bubbling CO2 through it and kind of gets pretty fancy, but it, it's a lot to learn. It's pretty cool. Uh, Will, before we go to yes. beer number number three tonight, uh, tell us a little bit about you went from Wyoming, then you came east, and tell yeah. us about your, so, uh, your yeah. third uh, brewery. Okay, um, the third brewery, I got to plug in my computer here. Um, so I left Wyoming and uh, right around 2000. So in a couple of different months, a couple of months um, through brewing connections, I had a friend of a friend, they're actually from Portland, Maine. Um, I'm going to start opening this beer if you have it, the pink and pale. There's a catamaran on there if you like to sale catamarans. It doesn't look like uh, the catamaran I have, but the, it's definitely a catamaran. So <laughs> I won that, won that war. Anyway, um, let's pour that correctly. And then actually give it a nice little head. So, um, yeah, so in 2000, I ended, I was back in New Hampshire where my parents were. And uh, through friends of a friend, um, I heard of somebody that was interested in opening a, a brew pub and they were looking for a brewer and uh, I met the owner and uh, he had a restaurant in Portland at the time. He sounded like he had a good concept. Um, I needed a job um, and I was able to do what I wanted to do, which was um, be the brewmaster, um, install a brewery from scratch. Um, we were able to find one in Plymouth, Mass, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Plymouth Bay Brewing had been open for a short time. Um, still had beer in the tanks, and we were able to uh, extract that brewery ourselves through the front window and uh, keep it in storage till um, the restaurant was ready in North Conway um, and installed the brewery. And um, I'm really excited now. Um, after my um, 12 years there, they're you know they've got a production microbrewery and they've got the restaurant and and uh, they've got a great strategy out there as well. They are serving food under tents. You know, just trying to survive this um, time that we're in. Mm -hmm. So we got the pink and pale here. Did that answer all your questions, Greg? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So let's yeah. talk about the pink and pale here, um, just to keep after the beers. Um, it's this one's losing its head a little bit. Um, it was just canned yesterday. Um, carbonation might be a little lower. We had a little trouble. Fill, uh, filling it so carbonation may not may not hold the head quite as well. Um, initially it was the same recipe as the Zog's Pale Ale. Um, my first uh, brewing assistant that uh, came out of Wall Street and then came out of um, drop-in breweries um, brewing school, um, he was really into beer and he said you know have you thought of uh, brewing with grapefruit? So. Um, I said, I haven't. So we looked into it and we designed a beer or we took a beer we had and added grapefruit to it and we liked it. But one thing we found because we're a brew pub and when we have, um, when you have uh, a beer next to the other beer, we saw how similar they were. So what we did is we tweaked the recipe of the pink and pale, um, dried out the beer a little bit, um, changed the dry hopping mostly um, so it tasted different than the Zogs. Um, the way we deal with it is we, we brew the beer, we ferment it mostly, and then when it goes into the secondary fermenter where we actually bung it and let the sugars, um, it's kind of a European technique, but you let the sugars carbonate the beer, the, the residual sugars that are left there, that's when it gets moved on to the grapefruit. So the grapefruit is not boiled, um, but it has to be sterile when it goes in. Um, and uh, that's when we add the dry hopping and um, the fruits. Uh, basically all our beers, we do it that way. Um, you can add to the kettle, you can do it different ways, um, but we tend to use, add a sterile 
um, either sterile group blueberries or sterile whatever um, or aseptic to um, the secondary fermenters and let the yeast kind of eat at the sugars but not blow the aroma away. Be careful of that. Oh, the brew pub in North Conway, um, that was called the Moat. Um, it was one of those long names when I first got there. It was the, we answered the phone, the Moat Mountain Smokehouse and Brewing Company. That was a tongue twister, um, but it uh, became known as the Moat. Um, and they're going strong and making great barbecue over there and, uh, and a lot of great people <laughs> over there. It's really kind of a, a cheers over there where everybody knows your name um, for a lot of people that uh, are that live over that way. Oh, so, okay. I see Nicole, you're excited about the sour. Yeah. We have some yeah, questions. so don't wait on <laughs> that. Uh, don't wait on that, Nicole, because the sour is, um, they didn't get that much. Um, I'm actually still, I'm one of the few guys that are out there that are still bottling. So if I can get some more bottles, um, I will. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they come from Europe because unfortunately the American glass has just gone cheaper and cheaper and uh, even with the beer not being over carbonated, bottles have broken and we've had uh, some issues with it. Um, in the past year, Sierra Nevada had a huge recall because um, the lips on the bottles that they bought um, US made were, there was too many that were breaking. Um, so that's you know one thing about cans. If if it gets a hole in it, it's not shrap metal. It's not broken glass flying around. Um, but the sour IPA um, is a wonderful beer. They only have a couple cases there at Beverage Warehouse. But because it's an IPA, um, enjoy it sooner rather than later, so that that hop bouquet is still still there. I'm going uh, tomorrow. Oh, okay, going great. Tomorrow. As for Jason, as okay, for Jason, Jason. say. Say, I heard you got the Wilco. best sour in Vermont in here. Okay, I'm going to tell him. Or ask him what the best sour in Vermont is, and if he doesn't oh, answer correctly, to. you can correct him. <laughs> I will. Sour uh, time. That's right. Okay, so we do have a few more questions. You better have the right in. answer. This is great. So, Nat, so Natty's asking, uh, did you or do you find dry hopping contributes to IPA fatigue? Um. No, not necessarily because uh, dry hopping is just kind of adding hops after um, after the boil and you're not going to boil the bitterness resins out as much. You're going to get the aroma compounds. Um, there's almost as many hops in the dry hopping process in my pale ale as there is in my Czech Pilsner, my, or I guess you call it a, a Munich style Pilsner. Um, there's, you know, there's quite a bit of hops in there. So the hop fatigue, I think, would more come from the bitterness and um, the punch of alcohol. You know, I think, uh, you know, for a lot of us, you know, not everybody has time in their day for an 8% beer. You know, it's kind of, you know, if it's a hot day and you want something light, you know, it's kind of where the, the popularity, I think, of uh, session IPAs come. Um, you know, years ago, a local uh, beer place, when he tasted my Zogs, he's like, wow, that's great. Uh, you should really sit, call in an IPA. Mm -hmm. You will sell more. You would sell more. Um, because it's dry hopped like an IPA. But for me, when it's under 6%, you know, under, you know, five and a half, five and a half, six percent 6%, it's still a pale ale. But what's interesting is if you look at nat national competition and you look at this description of a pale ale, and you look at the description of a session IPA, you know, the kind of the style guidelines change a little bit. There's a lot of overlap. There's the um, alcohol overlap that they're in the same, you know, alcohol range, IBU overlap. Um, I could easily call the Zogs a Zogs IPA. I just, I'm old school. I still call it a pale ale. So. Thank you. So James S. is saying, does the fruit hurt the head retention? Um, it definitely affects it. Um, it changes it. Um, you know, we're a small brewery, and, and we're lucky that um, we, you know, we're able to bring in a mobile canner to package our beer. Um, 
and get it out in the market in um, you know a reusable container that uh, you know that the customer wants. Um, it's definitely less expensive to um, to can, um, and um, we pass that along to the consumer. Um, but uh, I guess I've had a couple of new beers. Um, he said, "What was the question again?" There, I'm a little. Oh, the fruit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it will. Yeah. So it will affect the, the head fruit. retention. Yeah, um, exactly. In an ideal world, um, <clears throat> if I was able to can on site, um, I would carbonate the beer a little bit higher, and also have a little more control that I could have the beer basically at freezing when I package it, so that when it's opened, it has that right carbonation and it also brings those aromas out. Yeah, from tasting this, I think the Zogs is great. I mean, the uh, Pink and Pale is great that I'm trying right now. Um, I think if I, uh, my taste buds are insured, but I think uh, carbonation is a little bit lower than what I like to see. Oh, okay, great. Okay, well, let's, um, I know there are some other questions coming in, but let's move on to the next beer that we're tasting tonight. Um, so we make two different IPAs generally. Um, we make uh, the Idle Time H IPA, which is this one, if you don't have it. Oops, let me get it in the camera here. It's a little higher. Right. There's a gondola if you get to ride the lift or if you don't hike. <laughs> Um, it's an 8% IPA, but it's so round in terms of the mouthfeel. Um, I don't think it comes across as, as, um, as hot or, um, really alcoholic. It kind of sneaks up on you. Um, I guess people have said that for years, um, you know, that the beers that I make are, um, they can sneak up on you in terms of their, their smooth and balanced and maybe malty that you're, doesn't, they don't come across as hot or alcoholic. Um, so I said it's Simcoe based. Um, here we go. Hold it still. Um, there's the can. Um, and what did I say on there? It says uh, citrus, fruity, dry hopped, serene. Um, yeah, serene is kind of that turquoise lake sort of feeling when you, when it's just kind of everything's in balance. Um, it's different than the other IPAs around, I think, and people like it for that reason. Um, I think at this temperature, because it's warm in my kitchen here, it's warmed up a little bit. Um, it's uh, took two sips to get to answer that question. Um, yeah, it's not as bitter as what my neighbors do. Um, <laughs> you know, some of my neighbors are, are, are really masters of the craft of, um, of bittering beers and making very challenging beers. Um, and I guess I lean a little more toward the balanced and kind of, you know, a little bit of Johnny Cash, walk in the line, you know, have it be bitter enough so it's respectable in terms of an IPA, um, but maybe not bonking your on the head with um, the bitterness. Um, with that said, bitterness, just like aroma, is going to go down over time. So any of these beers, if, if you were buying my beer today and you came up to me, I would say, you know, buy, buy what you can enjoy in a month or a couple weeks, because I think that's when it, it tastes its best. The vice beer, the lagers we make, um, excluding the Pilsner, which is dry hopped, um, those other beers are going to last for months and, and should even improve in time to a certain degree. Um, but I, even though we, it could be a three month shelf life on our beers, I think they're best when they're fresh. Drink it fresh is, is what our neighbors say and other people do. So. It was, it was at my house. It was just hit like was huge that thunder in the background? lightning just came down in the middle of the campground. Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> It was very traumatic. All right. <laughs> Hands off the camper. That was dramatic effect on I'm not uh, touching it. Describing as yeah, so the grist in the um, 
You know, the grist in the um, IPA is very, um, it sounds like we have some people that are brewers and, and I really push, appreciate you all chiming in. So it makes it fun for me and, and makes it a uh, um, very active conversation. Um, the grist is very similar to um, the pale ales that I described earlier, if you heard that. Um, there's both Fawcett um, Pro Malt, which is a floor malt that they make. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, kind of like a Canadian, um, you know, big production um, pale ale malt that's really the workhorse, um, you know, that kind of keeps it drier. Um, the difference between the two is more malt, more malt for the um, IPA. That's the big difference. Um, you know, in the other thing with the IPA that as a home brewer really kind of, it, it's hard to get into, um, but the cut down on the actual leaf hops or the you know vegetative mass that we put into hops, um, we use an extract. Um, it's a um, it's a hop extract. Um, you don't want to get it in your hands and you don't want to get it in your eyes, but it's basically the bitter resins separated from the green vegetable mass. So what happens is the more hops that you throw into uh, a batch of beer the more you're going to lose volume because you have to separate it away from those hops eventually. Um, in our brew house, it's at the Whirlpool. Um, the hops in our Hellas, there's this, just this little, we do a little hop pile. In our IPA, there's you know this huge hop pile. So we don't yield as much wort down in the fermenter because of that, because of the amount of hops that we put in. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, no, I used to, I, uh, I've been, I've been using, uh, I saw the question on the crystal malts. No, I've been using crystal malts forever. Um, I have always found that I use just enough for color. Um, and I stay away from a, a beer that when it ferments out, you're tasting a sweetness from the crystal malt. Um, so it's, it's low percentages. Um, I don't percentage out my beer. I'm a little more tactile. Um, when I make my recipes, but um, I don't stay away from crystal. I just use small amounts, just enough to get the right color. And Al is asking, do you make any amber ales? Gosh, okay, so we didn't really talk about what we're doing at the pub right now. Um, generally, we have 10 beers on tap, so I can just describe those really quick. So, um, yeah, we, we do make ambers, we make browns, and we make different things. Um, different times of year, especially in the summer, we're trying to keep up with the demand of the beers that are being bought, being canned and keep up with the restaurant. You know, the way things are going for these first couple of weeks, we'll see how it, it pans out. I mean, we don't expect to be as busy um, in our restaurant as we were last year with everything that's going on, but um, we'll definitely be brewing, you know, more pink and pale, zogs and idle time um, to keep enough in the restaurant and then keep enough to can um, outside of there. So, oops, I said a crystal malt. Um, yeah, I mean, the one of the most popular beers or beer I'm very proud of over at the moat over North Conway is a um, is a brown ale. Um, I kind of perfected that recipe and I loved it. Um, if you've ever had it, I, I, I think it was kind of very similar to um, what you would have found uh, at, at Wall Wallover's Brown when they were making uh, beers down in uh, Middlebury. Um, I don't know if they're being made by Otter Creek at Wallover. I don't remember who was making those. I think it was Steve Parks but uh, and uh, Mark McGear down there. But uh, um, Mark McGear also made a really nice brown when he was at the Bobcat. So. Um, I want to know if are your beers all our beers are available. All beers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, most of them, most of them are. They they usually keep most of our beers um, available there at Beverage Warehouse. It's a great place to go. Um, you know, just one of my wait staff was asking today in terms of you know where are our beers? Um, you know, as you're mentioning uh, these days, uh, the, the strong ones that have been out there that have bought, been buying a lot of beers have been the um, the co-ops, because they're not only a supermarket, but they're also beer and wine. 
Um, so the sales there have been strong, whether you're at the White River Co-op down in uh, White River Junction, um, the, the one in Montpelier there, um, Hunger Mountain, um, the city markets, um, the, the liquor stores, 802 BWS, you know, any of those larger places that have a, a larger volume um, have still been uh, buying beer, even though um, it's been slow. Um, some of the local liquor stores and some of the other places, when you can't come into shop and you're just walking up the door and saying, this is what I want, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice whether you're going to sell as much beer there. Well, um, we are going to bring uh, evening to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank Will for uh, joining us this evening. This has really been informative, uh, not just about the beer, but it's also been about uh, uh, your background and really uh, di diving into how you make the beer, which has been, uh, been wonderful. Um, our guests, uh, Obviously, a number of them have a lot of information about knowledge Yeah, you know, and if anybody uh, has any questions beer beyond industry, that, um, my Your email is really wonderful. simple. Um, um, so, again, you know, when I get a chance, get out of production and look at those. My email is wgilson at idletimebrewing.com. And the only difference is it's T-Y-M-E, brewing.com. So if you have any further questions that I didn't answer or if you're, you know, you need some suggestions, happy to talk to you. And, uh, you know, you, you love to... Uh, meet people that are passionate about beer and, and talk about beer. That's why I got into it because um, when I was in college, I like to do, my problem was when I got out of school, I like to do too many different things. And the beauty thing, beautiful thing about brewing is you do all sorts of things. You do um, talking to people, selling your beer, you're in, in production work, you're doing, um, you know, making the beer and enjoying it with people, kind of building a product. So. There's a lot of facets to it that make it uh, really interesting. That's why so many people are like, I'm sick of the job I have. I want to do something fun and make beer. I just figured it out in 1995. That's all. So <laughs> thanks for joining. <laughs> thank you, Will. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. You're ahead of the game. Yeah, thank you to uh, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody for, for bringing, bringing in the questions this evening. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, good night, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. And have a good, uh, good weekend. Bye. Make sure you.